Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this Fellowship Friday, and we are having a special program tonight, uh, different than our regular Friday night program in that we have uh, Brother Jason Jack with us, and he's going to introduce an idea that is fascinating. Uh, he's made, uh, I guess he's probably made about five or six videos uh, roughly um, on this subject, and I've watched them all, and it's going to be blow your mind. Uh, it's going to make you really rethink some things and reconsider this. And the, the question is, what year are we living in now? Is this 2019? Or could it actually be 1019? Sound crazy? <laughs> okay. I thought it was crazy too. But uh, Brother Jason Jack has some great insights, and I believe a lot of things he comes up with that are um, a, a different, uh, maybe even unique. Uh, I, I believe God is speaking to him, and uh, we, we need to listen. So, uh, Brother uh, Jason Jack, uh, say hi to everybody. Why don't you introduce yourself, and maybe somebody here doesn't know you yet. Tell them what you're doing on YouTube, and then we'll get into the subject. By the way, Sister Renee Rowland is joining us any minute, so it'll be the three of us. I'm not going to put the link publicly for everybody to join because we want to be able to focus on this subject. But in the chat room, everybody, if you have questions, uh, put them in all caps, and, and then we'll try to respond to your questions. Go ahead, brother. Hey, Lou. Thanks for having me and to discuss this subject. Um, you know, briefly just introduce myself. My name is Jason Jack. I'm a plastic surgeon in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I have a YouTube video of the same name that I have had um, going now for three and a half years. And my YouTube channel points to the gospel of Jesus Christ and truths of the Bible. And in this journey over the last few years, I've really searched for truth in scripture and, and looking at historical evidence uh, to support that, looking at scientific evidence to support scripture. And I have learned that God's wisdom is way more infinite than man's wisdom. And I've come to realize that if history and if science, if they align with scripture, then I accept that. But if there's contradictions, then I question it. And I look at man's wisdom further in the sciences, in history. And I've come to a lot of, um, you know, um, realizations, if you will, uh, regarding this. What we're talking about tonight is something that I have had in the back of my head for a few years now. Um, and it was sort of put on the back burner. And then just in the past year, um, looking at scripture and reading it with this subject in mind, have come to see some things in scripture um, that would tend to lead me to believe that man has actually added time to our calendar and they have placed a thousand years even in the middle of our modern history as we know it. And we know this time period very well. It's taught in our history classes when we're growing up. It's the dark ages, the middle ages, this thousand years between 500 AD and 1500 AD, give or take a few years where we don't know much about it. And there wasn't a lot of, um, there's not a lot of historical evidence. There wasn't any progress. Uh, if you look at the history books in civilization for this thousand years, I begin to question that. And through questioning that, I've come to the conclusion that the dark ages have been fabricated and that a thousand years has been added into the middle of our timeline. And when I speak of the timeline, I'm talking about from the birth of Christ, the last 2000 years is what man will tell you that we live in 2019. But if you add a thousand years in the middle of that and then take it away because realizing that the dark ages never really existed, then we're not 2019 years since the birth of Christ, but just a little over a thousand years. And so this is what tonight's topic centers around. 
All right, thank you. Uh, and we have, as promised, uh, Sister Renee Rowland uh, joining us. And uh, hi, hi, Renee. Hey, guys. Hi, Dr. Jason. So good hey, to see you. I'm so happy to see you. You too, sis. Love you. Love you. I love everyone. Hi. Everybody. <laughs> Hello, James. I just uh, told the viewers, you know, to answer a matter for you here. The Bible says it's shame and folly to us. And although I'm not an expert on this, I'm coming in with an open mind. And I've looked at some of the stuff you put up. I've even found some things. And I'm sure a lot of people have questions. So there should be some more people coming soon. Yes. Well, yeah. That's pretty what? empty right now. Let, let's no, say hi to the, the oh, chat room. I don't see anything in the chat right, right there. Hold on. He wants to see. Yep. See? 30, oh. 32. Okay. There we go. We're yeah. very excited. Yeah. Uh, let's say hi to the chat room uh, first here. There's a, a couple of people had comments and questions already, but uh, let me see. Uh, um, there's a... Uh, uh, Bushcraft Arnold, welcome. I, I, I don't recognize the name, so if this is your first time, welcome uh, to our congregation here. And he, he writes, I've never heard of this topic before. I'm interested in learning more with an open mind. Well, that's that's the right attitude to have. Yes, it is. And, uh, and then we got, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, someone wrote, uh, uh, Oh yeah, liberally conservative brother Luke. I went over your playlist on Tulip, and went to Carm videos. And I thank you for your playlist as well as uh, thank Renee. Uh, your vids are helpful. So, okay, to the uh, to the chat room. Uh, for, if you're a regular participant in the congregation, welcome back. If it's your first time with us, uh, welcome. I, I hope you have a great time with us tonight. Maybe you'll join us every Friday night and Wednesday night at nine thirty Eastern. Uh, the Wednesday Night Bible Study, the Fellowship Friday, and you can also join us Sundays at 5 p.m. Eastern for our church program uh, for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Uh, okay, uh, so the introduction, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the best way to approach this since you're, you're uh, I would say you're the expert on this subject, uh, even though you're still figuring it out, I think, to a certain extent. But uh, let me start off by asking the, the first question that everybody might be thinking. Uh, right? I think you're, you're um, suggesting that probably with Pope Gregory, uh, I don't remember the year that, that he was the Pope, uh, but I he wonder. established a new calendar. And could you speak on that and, and what happened and why you think that, uh, that our time is, uh, was manipulated with and why they lied to us about that time first, brother. Yeah, um, and I think probably the best way to address that is just starting at the birth of Christ and then just quickly going to that period, um, which is 1582, if you look at the history books, but I think it's 582. Um, and so I'm going to look at it as 582 years from the time of the birth of Christ to the change from the Julian to Gregorian calendar, just to quickly, hopefully in a couple minutes, just show you what was going on. But after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ um, and the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit indwelled men to go out and preach the gospel to all nations. The word of God spread like wildfire. There was a lot of persecution at first, um, but it continued. But the word of God got out through holy men and prophets of God with the book of Revelation being, you know, I think the last book of the Bible written in roughly 80, 80 to 90, you know, if you believe the most of the sources. So let's just make it a, a hundred just for a nice round number. So from 8100 to 8300, you had scribes that were writing the different books of the Bible and, um, you know, and, and writing them just word for word. And the distribution of the word of God got out to hundreds of it within within a few hundred years to it was written in well over three four hundred languages 
And the Catholic Church at that time um, was coming to, through, I think, the spirit of Antichrist, opposing the Word of God. And as fast as it was spreading, they were trying to rain it down. They were basically burning the Bible and burning people who were writing the Bible and preaching the Word of God. And this led to the different translations in English leading up to the King James Bible. Again, in 1611, or was it 611 after Christ? So you have the Wycliffe Bible um, in, you know, I think 380 years after the birth of Christ, 280 years after the book of Revelation being written, followed by the Tyndale Bible, then the Great Bible, the Geneva, the Dewey Reims, uh, the Bishop's Bible leading up in this 150, 200 year period um, to the preserved word of God that we have now, the King James Bible. If you look at history, it will tell you that there were, um, you know, the first few hundred years, there were a lot of Bibles out, you know, written in many languages, but then you had a thousand years where uh, the word of God really didn't get out and nobody could read or understand it, but the word of God has been preserved and it's for every generation. Um, and so I think what was happening was there was persecution um, of holy men of God, getting the word of God out. And this led ultimately to the, Protestant Reformation, and then the Counter-Reformation uh, that came about from that. You had the Council of Trent um, in the early 1500s that came about because of this. And ultimately, you had Pope Gregory the Thirteenth come in charge in, if you look at history, the late 16th century again. I'm looking at this from a thousand years from where we are now to the birth of Christ. So uh, at about the halfway, a little over the halfway point, you have the Gregorian calendar being introduced. And this was a massive change um, where the Julian calendar was what they would basically a lot of countries use. But the Gregorian calendar changed time as we know it. And I think this is when the deception happened. Um you had the Gregorian calendar introduced and with it, you had a thousand years. So you say, well, how did that happen? How did nobody catch on? Um, well, that leads me to what I show a lot of evidence in a lot of my videos. And I, I've made like 10 videos on this and I did not mean to make this many, you know, it just sort of, I just kept seeing the evidence and, you know, just kept researching this. But the dating system after Christ began where the, on documents, on books, on coins, um, maps, tombstones, you name it, that they would use Anno Domini, um, meaning you're the Lord, but then they would use an I for Jesus. J the J was not a alphabet letter at that time. The J didn't come about uh, until the 1600s and really didn't become prominent in most cultures to well into the 1700s. So like if you look at the King James Bible in 1611, the first edition, that King James is written I-A-M-E-S. You know, Jesus is written I-E-S-U-S. -S. And so the dating system was Anno Domini Jesus, the year of the Lord Jesus, 200 AD, the year of the Lord Jesus, 300, 400, and so on and so forth. Um, but at this calendar change, the I that was that was after ad or anno domini became a one and that was the thousand years that have been added now there was a lot of um the um arabic numerals 
were coming in, into popularity about the same time. Some people were still using Roman numerals. Sometimes the ones did look like I's. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes a smaller case I was used that obviously was not the number one that preceded um, the date. And, and then as you got into the later into the 17th century and then in really in the 1700s as we know it now, you would see a change where the I became a J for Jesus because the letter I was now a J, the letter J came into existence. And so um, I think through this manipulation of how the dating system was used and then the addition of a, a new calendar system, um, you know, basically blinded the eyes and they just thought, well, this is how it is. Um, and, you know, we see this now, you know, we've had the BCAD dating system changed in our lifetime to BCE and CE before the current era and current era. We see that in every scientific journal. It's not BCAD. Um, so somebody, you know, a few hundred years from now could look back and say, why is an E added to BC before Christ? You know, um, you know, things have been changed. And so I think there's manipulation there. So I'll turn it back to you and we'll continue. Can okay. I ask a question, Brother Luke? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Renee, what, you have any questions so far? Yeah, I wanted to say when you did those videos, the visual aids you have to explain the I in front of the 600s made a huge difference because there was no doubt that that was not a one. There was no doubt that those maps and those coins, and it occurred to me, I can't believe I was blind enough to not even notice this, that in the book of Daniel, it confirms what you're saying. Because it says, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And we know they changed the Ten Commandments to take out graven images and split thou shalt not covet into two. So they have ten. And uh, a lot of people don't know that, that the Catholic Church did that. Removed one of the laws and split coveting into wife and then property. So it says that he will change think to change times and laws. So that that's really interesting. I, I had never thought of that before. And also it would also mess people up since they now had God's word in their hand. It could confuse them on the prophetic timelines. What would be a happening when it'd be a lot harder to figure those things out and you're right they were they killed one family just for teaching their children the lord's prayer uh in their in german in the modern language they wanted everything out of the hands of the people and and said priests were the only ones that had the right uh, except for you know luther and a bunch of other ones showed them the verse that the word of god is profitable for every believer and necessary unto every good work so this is just fascinating, but I wanted to know, do you have the ability to put any of the visuals up so that you can explain to them what you mean by, you know, you're the Lord, I, is there any way to do that? Yeah, um, I I'm going to I can, me, I'm gonna click on screen share. Tell me if you see this and if you're able to access it. Can you see it? No, sir. Well, uh, no. it, it, it says I clicked on it, it says screen share, uh, but I don't know what else to do. Entire screen, okay. Um, I don't know how to do it. I was just, yeah, well, maybe I'm Matthias ready. is going to be in the chat room and he can okay tell me how to do the screen share because uh, when you all, see all it, I've done is I click on screen share, I can see a thing come up. But but if you can't access it, I don't know what else to do. Hey, Brother Luke, I see it in my top left hand corner. I don't have anything pulled up right now, but I can if you want to talk a couple of minutes with Renee, I can pull up a couple of things real fast. OK, I've got Just to give a couple of examples got, before. Got, going yeah, forward. Go ahead. Uh, OK, do you, uh, do you can you access the screen share yourself? That's I think you have to click on the screen share. Do I do. It. I can. All right. Then. Uh, OK, Renee. Yeah, this is, um, it had never occurred to me, like, why in the world somebody do that? But that now it's starting to make some sense. And I looked up, like, how would they get away with this? 
And actually, it wouldn't be that hard, especially for the mass public, because they just accepted whatever the government said. So if they woke up, I, I think the year that he's talking about when he said the halfway point was, it says Sunday, October 4th, 582 AD, was actually followed by Friday, October 15th, 5, uh, 1582. So they woke up in 582 and, uh, let's see, and, 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 and woke up the next morning in 1582. And the way they did that is if uh, they did that, added those years, they'd have to add 13 days. But in order to keep Easter on a Sunday, they had to add only 10 days. And so uh, I'm not sure if the February 28th, 29th leap year thing has anything to do with that. I'm not sure. But um, they did mix up something because they didn't add the necessary 13 days, but the 10 so it was Sunday, October 4th, 582, followed by Friday, October 15th, 1582, on the new Gregorian calendar with no change in weekly continuity. So it wouldn't skip days. They'd be able to add it. Um, well, I'm, um, I see Con uh, uh, Matthias has responded to trying to help me. But I'm not seeing it, Matthias. Uh, he wrote, there is a pres present to everyone button. It is green and in the top center of the broadcast screen. Um, is that the thing? Screen share thing. Is that that? Yeah, it says screen. Yeah, mine doesn't say present to everybody. It says screen share. And when I click on that, it doesn't allow me to click anything and make anything happen with it. What's that so, showcase thing? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Matthias, uh, when I click on that, it shows a screen share thing, but to make it, to, to, it doesn't uh, respond if I click on it any, any further. Uh, but let me uh, let me say something while, while he's getting things set up, uh, to, Renee. Now, you know, of course, we agree on uh, the, the core doctrines of Christianity, and we love to talk about all kinds of other things. And when we disagree, I find it more interesting because we sure. learn a different point of view and consider, because if two people disagree on something, uh, either either one of them is wrong or maybe both of them are wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know where I stand yeah. on it, but I'm sure looking into it, but, you but, know, but if okay. Jason Jack says it might be true, I think but, it's worth looking at. Well, I'm, I'm referring to a different subject now, but this rule could, should be applied for, to everything, okay? If sure. two people disagree, this is an opportunity to engage and uh, learn each other's point of view and consider them, because uh, if you disagree, one of you has got to be wrong, and maybe both are wrong. So uh, with that attitude, uh, I will say in eschatology, uh, I, I left your position. I've told you this many times. For 20 years, 25 years, I held to the view that could be should be called dispensational futurism. Uh, that's the position you still hold to, and that's the popular position in America today. Uh, but I believe this was popularized by John Nelson Darby, and it's a relatively new viewpoint on end times. But I did hold that position. Uh, I learned it very well and defended it for 25 years. Are you talking but, about like millennial kingdom being literal and stuff? Yeah, yeah, okay. yes, yeah, that's part of it. The millennial kingdom is part of this end times thing. So now I know that you, you believe that, uh, as most people do, that there's going to come a point in time where Jesus sets up a literal physical kingdom on earth for a thousand years. Yeah. And this, this viewpoint is called uh, premillennialism. In other words, wow. Jesus is going to have the rapture, the resurrection, and, and uh, the, uh, the his tribulation. All that stuff will happen prior to this millennial kingdom on earth. That's premillennialism. But this thing that br uh, Brother Jason is, is uh, uncovering for us, I think uh, it fits in well with uh, either pre uh, post millennialism or a millennialism, and we're going to try to define those. But uh, let me ask uh, brother uh, Jason. Um, uh, I don't know if you're going to be able to access and do the sh share screen share. I hope you can do that. But I want to, I would, to tell Renee and the on uh, the viewers. How does this impact your viewpoint on how the time fits together? Because the question is, why would they do it? 
And I believe it's to deceive us so that we don't know how close we are uh, to this uh, thousand years playing out. And, and so how would you define, uh, I just defined what uh, premillennialism, that's the position Renee holds and probably most of our congregation, but how would you define amillennialism and postmillennialism and how does that factor into this whole subject you're talking about? Yeah, and I think that will ultimately be what a lot of this show is about is eschatology and because this has a huge impact on the reading of the book of Revelation and how we interpret that if the addition of a thousand years has been added. Obviously, I am referring to Revelation 20, where a thousand years is mentioned six times in seven verses. I mean, this is hammered over and over and over a thousand years, a thousand years. And because of that, I've always taken that as being a literal 1000 years. And that's why I really haven't looked into all millennialism, which is not a literal thousand year reign, but that the kingdom of God is reigning and ruling now with us as priests and saints getting the word out and that the thousand years is the quote spiritual church age. It's not a literal thousand years, but a spiritual time period referred to as the church age from the first coming to the second coming. So that's why I've always tended to lean to premillennialism and looking at that as the proper eschatology viewpoint. But this has changed the way I interpret eschatology now. And we, you know, I'll, I'll share a lot of that with you towards the end. Um, but before we do that and go on, let me just see if I got this screen share where I can do this. Um, and let's see, I'm going to share. Can you see, can, what do you see now, Luke? Do you just you're see me? See your noggin. Just my noggin. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> All right. Let's see. Do you see, do you see it now? Yes. Yes. I see it. Yes, okay. beautiful. So this is this is a coin. I just went, it, you could do this literally for hours and look at old coins and just type in, you know, 1600, 1700 coins. Um, and it will just come up over and over. So, you know, just in a few minutes, I picked up this, you know, I did not mean for it to be 666 here, but you can see, you know, this is, 1666 according to most historians but is that a one or is that an i or could it even be a j you know with the time period during this transition from the digit i to j for jesus you know so is this the year of the lord jesus 666 um you know let's go to another one here's another one you see is this 1602 or is it I for Jesus? You're the Lord Jesus 602. Um, you know, you see this. Um, this is this is an I here. It's very similar to here. Um, if you look at other characters, here's an I right here within the within the name of Massachusetts. Is that Massachusetts or something? Um, but I don't think Massachusetts has an I, but, um, you know, it's the same character and it is a different font. It's bold. Uh, it's different than the six, you know, it's, it's not written in the same. So um, I think this is you're the Lord Jesus 662. Um, you know, again, here, um, is this 1652 or is this I 652 for you're the Lord Jesus. Um, and then going back to that, I guess, let's see. Did I, here's another one. Um, you know, this is a capital letter. It's spaced differently. Um, it's It looks like an I. It doesn't look like the number one. Um, here's an I right here in Hispania. It's the same exact character. So, you know, you either have to say that this is an I for you're the Lord Jesus, or this is a Roman numeral one. Um, 
And so I think that's where a lot of the, and I'll close these down. I think that's where a lot of the confusion is, is that Roman numerals were also used at that time period. And I think there was a lot of deception too with the dating using Roman numerals during this time period. I think the Catholic Church had a lot to do with destroying books that were written with the dates um, Anno Domini Jesus in the year and began to use Roman numerals. Um, you see you see both in Shakespeare, uh, for instance. You see in some of his plays on the cover pages, you will see Sometimes it would be like for the year 1600, for instance, if Romeo and Juliet was written in that year, you would see an I-600. But then in other uh, publications at that time period, you would see the year 1600 written with Roman numerals. So that was another way to blur the lines, if you will, um, to deceive people. Um, let me see if I can get a couple of maps real fast. You know, we looked at capital letter I. Here's a map of Tartary, uh, which is a subject in and of itself. But if you look up here in the top right-hand corner of this map, it says, Tinduk, a kingdom where Christians reigned in the year I-290. Uh, so obviously, this is not a one here. Uh, it's an I. And if you go down to the bottom... And there's a Great Wall of China, by the way, in this map showing that it's the northern border of China um, with the southern protecting from the southern border of Grand Tartary. And you can see that it was built between the bottoms of the mountains by the king of China against the incursions of the Tartars. Uh, again, uh, I'm looking at that also. But if you see here, this is the date of the map. Is this year the lord 1626 or you're the lord jesus with an i 626 um and so you know here's another map for instance um and hopefully you can see that right there in the middle under um america at the right hand it shows the date is that 1688 or is it anno you're the lord jesus I-688. You see that the I is written in the same exact font as year, year of the Lord, with the six being much bigger as the beginning of the date, 688. So, you know, and I'll, I'll um, give the links or the playlist, or Luke, you can get the playlist that's got, you know, just dozens and dozens of examples on these videos um, of that. But I'm glad I got the share that in in this chat uh just so you can see some visual examples of what i was talking about yeah that that makes a huge difference hey, hey brother luke uh-huh one of the viewers here uh we, we weren't changing the topic he was saying one of the ways we might be able to check this theory is one the japanese calendar or two check the um placement of the planetary alignments to see if a thousand years had passed are the planets where they should be and that's why i mentioned flat earth some people don't believe some yeah. some flat earthers don't believe they're there and others do yeah. so we couldn't actually use that to test for all yeah. people like all but, people won't but one find thing that. we do agree on is that japan japan does exist so i think using japanese calendars they don't have so that's an idea because they have their own little on, tribal baby. religions yeah so, hey, have we yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, into that right. is there a way Let's to check that. it that sounds good jason jason uh uh what do you think about um being able to confirm this uh i i think the the videos you've made and between the coins the maps the tombstones all these things it's very compelling uh, but then sometimes people will say, well, there's some historic events and, 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 and now like, what about the Japanese calendar? Um, uh, is there anything that's, that's been a, um, like a real uh, stumbling block for you as far as, okay, you're pretty sure this is right, but there's one thing that like really sticks out as a, a you really can't get over that one. Um, you know, again, I'm just in the infancy of researching this from a historical standpoint from different cultures. Um, it, but here's what 
here's my thoughts on that. Like, for instance, when the the Roman Empire supposedly fell in 476 AD, and then the Dark Ages began right after that for a thousand years, and then all of a sudden in the 1500s, there was this huge renaissance called the Renaissance, um, where you see the same things that were being built in Rome and the same sculptures that were being carved and the same style of architecture and art um, during that culture did a thousand years just go in the middle of that and then all of a sudden there was this reintroduction explosion of this or what's more likely is the fall of rome happened and that the renaissance happened right after that and it was just a basic continuation it was that was contemporaneous Um, you see you see like um you know the the busts and sculptures of Tiberius Caesar, for instance, who is mentioned in the Bible before, you know, when Augustus was general and he was Caesar. Um, and we have those busts in marble of Tiberius Caesar. And then you have 1500 years later, you have the Michelangelo's David. It's the same exact style. It looks the same. There's the same wear and tear just with, you know, there's no way that it could be, you know, a thousand years difference between those two or 1500, but more likely that those renditions were more contemporaneous. Um, and so, and, and then looking at Tartary again, you know, I think a lot of history has been hidden from us um, for whatever reason. And so, um, you know, there's things like people have asked me, about you know well we know for a fact that the pope and their genealogies are accurate and go all the way back to peter uh you know but they they're liars um and there's been many people throughout the centuries that have shown errors within the papacy uh dating for for instance you know pope gregory the 13th was supposedly ruling and reigning in the late 16th century, 1582 uh, into the 1600s. Well, you know, coincidentally, a thousand years earlier, there was Gregory the Great. Um, that was exactly a thousand years before Pope Gregory the 13th. Um, and so a lot of times, I don't think necessarily what we have now in history um, can be trusted. And I think a lot of that are honest mistakes. For instance, you know, on one of my videos, I showed where people had found a lot of these European coins and were looking at them. And some had where it said 300 AD and then, or 400 or 500 AD, and then the other said 1500 AD. And so they would have to, um, and then some said X. And that's another thing is, Christ was also represented with an X in some cultures, like in Romania, for instance, um, where the X was for Christos um, and not I for Jesus. And so historians gathered all these different coins and said, well, these have these are a thousand years apart. But, you know, they were gathered at the same exact points at the same time. And basically they just made honest mistakes. They had this thousand years they had to fill in, you know, and so they were finding some coins that they thought maybe in 400, 500, 600 AD, and then others 14, 15, 1600 AD, they were all coming from the same time period. But because of this thousand years addition to the calendar, they had to fill the holes in. Uh, And so, you know, and it all goes back ultimately, you know, to, the Bible, the word of God, and why would man do this? And so I make it a point that I believe that spiritual wickedness in high places were ruling over evil men, a lot of them within the Catholic Church, the Antichrist beast system, to do such a thing 
for two reasons. One, to distance mankind from the gospel of Jesus Christ, thinking that we're a lot further away than we are from his death, burial, and resurrection. But on the other end, to cast doubt on his certain return and when that may be. And that's why Peter writes in 2 Peter 3 that there's going to be scoffers coming in the last time. There's mockers. There's people that saying, you know, where's the sign of his coming? You know, the earth's been going on forever, just the way it is since creation. Um, you know, that's what time does. You know, the addition of time, you know, just think of evolution on a grander scale. You know, the addition of millions of years or even billions of years with the Big Bang, mankind is, you know, evil men are trying to distance man from God and his creation um, to think that, oh, well, maybe we are, you know, this this whole thing was just a colossal accident and just happened where chaos came into order. And then through billions of years of evolution, we formed and that we're nothing more than stardust. Uh, forget Jesus, the stars died, you know, like Lawrence Krauss says that Jason Cripps mentioned on the last show. Um, you know, that's what Tom does. And so I'm trying to yank that thousand years out if it's truly there. And still, I'm looking at this um, with an open mind. I want people to be brilliant about it and look at it. But what um, I'll let you continue from here, Luke and Renee. But I think after um, your comments, I want to go into some scripture and sort of show some things that I've seen about possibility of the manipulation of time and how that affects in times and eschatology. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I say this quite often because it's, it's true. I know we need to recognize this, that uh, the, the, all the problems that we encounter today, like the false gospel message, like, um, like the claim that uh, Jesus isn't God uh, in the flesh, the, the, the claim that uh, there was no resurrection, all these things that were, there are errors that we have to argue against today, uh, they happened in the first century too. So there's no, uh, all, all the heresies are ancient. And uh, Peter said, um, I think I'm paraphrasing as best I can, uh, uh, the, the, the Lord is not slack in his promise or his coming. He is long suffering, not desiring that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So why is Peter saying that? Because at the time people were saying, well, where is he? You know, you're, you're, everybody's talking about how he's going to return. Look how much time has passed. Where is he? And, uh, and so now not only has a little bit of time passed and they're losing patience for his return back then, but now we've got 2,000 years almost uh, that have passed, if that our calendar is correct. And, and so people basically are saying they can really write it off as saying, well, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. See, look at all the time that's passed. And, but if the calendar is actually 1,019, then we're getting very close to 1,000 years being having passed. And uh, I believe we are getting very close to the, the second coming. And I do believe it coincides with a thousand year period. So that I believe is a very good, that's one of the things I like about this. In fact, all of the things you presented are really a very, um, uh, I think, good um, proofs uh, archaeologic from an archaeological point of view. But with the scripture, and the promise of his coming and the thousand year question, all those things seem to fit in with this idea that you've got here that we're really a thousand years earlier in our calendar. Than, uh, so that to me is what is fascinating about this. I, I hope I was clear and not confusing everybody. Can I say something? Yeah, but I, I want to get Jason's thoughts on that or your thoughts sure. on it before you go to anything else. You know, were you going to respond to what I said or? It was something you both said. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I was just going to say it's uh, important that you both pointed out that regardless of the heresy or the error, it is all coming from a spiritual source. You know, a lot of people are saying, why would somebody do this? Well, 
where, like he said, spiritual wickedness in high places. What do they? What does the devil do? He steals, kills, and destroys. He is a liar and the father of lies. So he will lie. He will use any deception possible. And we got to remember, you know, the, the victors write history. Like Jason was saying, you know, they could have gone back and tried to work it. But I liked when Jason brought up the artwork. This is the kind of stuff I look for, you know, like what do we see that has a thousand years put in it? But actually, in reality, it's really closer. It's it's almost the same, you know. So I just wanted to point out that both of you said these are spiritual spiritual forces that are behind any kind of error or heresy or falsehood. Yeah. Well, uh, brother, uh, the, the, the point about the thousand years uh, fitting in with a thousand year period, uh, whether you want to call it the millennium or the church age or, or the kingdom or whatever, uh, it, it, this, uh, if we're really a thousand years earlier in history, it does line up perfectly with that. And so that's why it really, uh, I'm encouraged by it. And so now Luke, I want to look at some scripture and then make that a segue of looking at the book of revelation, especially revelation 20, and then talking about, um, how this may affect in times and how close are we, uh, and how this has sort of, uh, led me to looking at the book of Revelation and this millennial reign in a different view. Um, and so like Renee mentioned initially, Renee, that was Daniel 7, 25, and he shall speak great words against the most high, shall wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. You know, that was one of the first prophetic verses that I looked at and began to wonder based on already knowing sort of this historical um, dating um, possibility of the change of, well, it's actually mentioned in the Bible that they would do this. And, and Daniel prophesied of a changing of times and laws. And you know, don't let the second part of that verse go unnoticed relating to this topic, you know, and it shall be given into his hand until a time of times and dividing of time. Most people will say, well, time stands for one year, time stands for two years, and dividing of time is a half a year. Daniel's talking about the three and a half years, the last three and a half years, the tribulation period before Jesus returns. But what if it's talking about time being a thousand years times being the addition of a thousand years and the dividing of time this thousand years being put right in the middle of the thousand years what if it's a dual prophecy what if the changing of times and laws is this given into his hand until a time and then he added time he the addition of times and divided the time as we know it between the birth of Christ and his return. Um, and so that was sort of the first verse that I looked at. And we see a parallel verse in Revelation 12, uh, 14. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. Again, what is what if this is a literal thousand year church age period where it's talking about this thousand year time period where there's been additional time which has half the time um as we know it um or place in the middle to divide the time into two one thousand years where really it's simply a one thousand year period like the bible says like revelation 20 says um you know and Getting back to Peter, uh, you know, in Second Peter, Luke, you were you were quoting Second um, Peter three nine. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Now, this is an end times chapter that uh, Peter is writing, um, but the verse before that, verse eight says, "But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing." 
that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And I made a video about the day of the Lord and how the day of the Lord is mentioned many times in prophecy. Uh, the major prophets, the minor prophets that's used in the New Testament. And it is referring to one of three things, always. It's referring to the prophecy of Jesus' first coming, his first advent, virgin birth, or it's prophesying of his second coming when he will return to judge the earth. Or the third thing, it's referring to the period of time within that time period of his virgin birth to his second coming. And so, you know, what of this day of the Lord that began at his birth began a literal 1000 year period and that we see in Revelation 20, it mentions six times of this 1000 years that it's a literal 1000 years and that it's not a future thing as premillennialism looks at. Um, where Jesus comes back to establish an earthly kingdom for a thousand years. But what if we are ruling with him right now with the gospel as kings and saints, you know, spreading the gospel that we're part of the first resurrection um, with him being, um, you know, the resurrected Christ and we be and that we are in Christ as believers um, through our faith in him, you know, and, and that, the kingdom is now. It's not a future kingdom, but it's a spiritual kingdom. Um, and we are part of it right now as the body of Christ and that the church has been this body of Christ over the past thousand years and not 2000 years that the dark ages have been fabricated. And that Peter may actually be speaking truly on this church age, literal 1000 year period uh, and prophesying of this. Um, in Psalms 94, 90 verse 4, it says, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. So, you know, that again is, is prophecy, in my opinion, um, discussing a watch in the night. You know, um, Jesus is telling us in, in Mark, at the end of Mark 13, to watch what I say unto one, I say unto all, watch. Um, and that he comes as a thief in the night, but uh, we being children of light, believers who are searching the scriptures, that he's not going to be coming as a thief in the night. We're going to be seeing these, you know. Um, you know, I think that he will give his children, as it gets closer to that time, he will give us revelations. He'll give us knowledge. You know, I think the knowledge that goes to and fro that Daniel speaks of isn't, earthly knowledge and like, oh, technology and all this advancements, but spiritual knowledge. I think it's God's wisdom that will be given uh, to his church um, during that time period. Um, let me keep going a couple more. Um, well, let me just do two more. Isaiah 60, 21 and 22 specifically, thy people also shall be all righteous. They shall inherit the land forever. This is speaking of believers, the branch of my planning, the work of my hands that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand and a small one, a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. So verse 22, a little one shall become a thousand and a small one, a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. I think this is prophecy of the year of the Lord when Jesus came to live us in this life and die for our sins and overcome death for us through his resurrection. And that this little one, this one mediator, then over the church age through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ, spreading the gospel to all nations over this thousand years that we have become a strong nation. Now, it may not be strong in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. Um, I think that's what it's talking about. And then finally, um, Ecclesiastes 6.6. 6, Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place. Now, this is in context. King Solomon is writing of wicked men. 
and the judgment of wicked men. Um, and I find it interesting that in this context, you know, we're speaking of spiritual wickedness in high places, influencing evil men to possibly manipulate time so that to distance us from the gospel of Jesus Christ and to cast doubt and be uncertain um, on his return um, in the world's eyes that King Solomon said, though he live a thousand years twice told, what, what's this thousand years twice told? You know, is this a prophecy of the changing of times and laws in addition of a thousand years? Um, and so those are just a few verses um, that have merit as being, you know, possibility of prophecy of this changing of times and laws. So you comment on that. And then I think next, let's go to Revelation 20. Just look at the first seven verses where it mentions the thousand year um, you know, where we get our thousand year millennial reign doctrine. And then let's talk about how that may be viewed in other, in another light. If this, you know, thousand years being added to the calendar has merit. All right. Uh, okay. I want to, uh, confess to everybody a mistake that I made and I hope that you will not make the same mistake. Uh, I have about 40 books in my bookshelf from uh, one particular author, Dr. Peter Ruckman. And I have another book that he recommended by, uh, he says, you should put this book, Dispensational Truth by Clarence Larkin, put it on one side of the Bible. And on the other side of the Bible, put Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. That was Dr. Ruckman's recommendation. So I, my mistake was um, trusting Dr. Ruckman too much. I, I still admire him. He's with the Lord now. But uh, I think that we, we, we are, unfortunately, we sometimes embrace a, a teacher and with so much respect that whatever they say goes. Uh, I know I did. Uh, I just, whatever Ruckman's position was, was my position. You know, I, I hope you don't make that mistake, but uh, his position was um, Darby Schofield's position and dispensational futurism. And I learned it as well as anybody we know and, and taught it and defended it. But um, I really think that um, we, we need to open up our minds instead of just defending something that we are taught by a teacher that we respected and admired and, and, and be willing to listen to other viewpoints. Once I did that about seven years ago, I decided, okay, these are the things that have been ingrained into me that I am. And I, and this is, these are the doctrines I've held to and taught, but maybe I'm wrong. I, I need to listen to other viewpoint and this idea of, premillennialism that I mentioned earlier, that there's going to be a rapture, a tribulation, a second coming in that order. And then, and then there's going to be uh, a 1000 year literal millennial reign by Jesus on the earth. That's the position. And, and that's what I thought was correct. Uh, but uh, the other, I actually, if you watch my playlist, dispensationalism, futurism, preterism, historicism, millennial, rapture it's a long title but all of those subjects are part of this playlist that i, I hope you'll look at but um, what you see in that playlist is i moved away from dispensational futurism to uh, i mean premillennialism i moved away to and took the position of amillennialism and amillennialism is the thousand years is um not to be taken literally just like we do not take a, 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 a thousand cattle on a thousand hill, hills, uh, literally. It just means that it's a large number. And that uh, this, so this thousand should be taken as a large number rather than a literal thousand. That's the position I took. And there, was, there are three positions. Premillennialism, no millennium, that's a millennium. It's not literal. And then there's postmillennialism. But since Brother Jason has introduced this idea about the thousand years, and I think well documented the evidence for it, I think it's moved me from a millennial to post millennial. Uh, because 
if if it is a thousand years earlier, we're getting close to this church period, uh, the, the body of Christ, the church. The, Jesus said, don't say, look low here and low there. The kingdom is not low here or low there. It's within you. It's a spiritual kingdom and it's now. So the, the post-millennial view is that the kingdom started with, with Jesus and has been running now for almost a thousand years. So if that is the case, then we could very well have a little, literal thousand year period that we're approaching the very end of it very soon. It also fits perfectly with some of the other subjects we talked about, like transhumanism and uh, and uh, uh, artificial AI and all these things. Everything is coming to a head right now to fit in with a thousand year period ending. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I think I, I would probably have to class myself as if not certain, but certainly leaning towards uh, post-millennialist now. So I've actually been pre-millennial, a-millennial, now post-millennial. <laughs> okay. Brother Luke, uh, that's why I won't do a lot on the prophetic. Um, I will try to divide to who, wh what's going on, what covenant is he under when he's talking about it. And to whom is he referring? The nation, like national Israel, or is he referring to um, uh, the church, which is both Jew and Gentile, neither Jew nor Gentile. And I think it's good that you said that when I did the video to upload tonight. I said, let's let's uh, all just, hey, even if you don't agree on something, we can at least understand why someone we care about and respect believes it. So we can understand others' viewpoints. And because I have been, I tried not to um, listen to uh, many people or hardly anybody while I was studying those 12 years. I tried to just make it the Bible, but you can't help it when you've heard something so many years, like you were listening to Ruckman and you hear something so many years and that's just the way you interpret it. And so I still have bondage and preconceived notions about things. And so um, I try not to to argue it because I'm not on steady ground, like solid ground on a lot of it. Like I'm still, the, the vote's still out for me on some of this stuff. And so I like to right now, um, I agree with you and I disagree with you. You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's um, good that we understand why the people we care about and respect have a different position and be willing to hear each other uh, but I also want to say it's hard when you have ingrained something's been told to you so many times, like when Brother Jason did the times time and time and a half. Um, he could be right. There could be a dual meaning. There's dual meanings in scripture all the time. The deep, deep layers, the literal and then the prophetic, you know, so it's it's good to just think uh, differently and allow people uh, to show the right. It's very interesting. I mean, this concept. It is fascinating to me. I don't know where I stand on it yet, but I uh, I wouldn't be surprised, you know. All right. I, I might have talked a little too long about that, and maybe I jumped ahead uh, What the point you, you're going to make next. But go ahead, brother. All right. So next, let's get to Revelation 20, because this is the passage that well, that determines, I think, a lot where somebody stands on the millennium, because this is the only time that it is mentioned uh, this thousand years. So we thought until, you know, possibly I showed some other verses that may, um, you know, that may complement it. But I want to read just the first seven verses of Revelation 20 and then talk about that and talk about how my eschatology viewpoint, uh, my perspective has changed and it's still changing. Um, but Revelation 20, one through seven, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan and bound him a thousand years. That's the first time it's mentioned and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. So there's a thousand years fulfilling that needs to be done while Satan is bound. 
That's the second time it's mentioned. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Um, then verse four, and I saw thrones and they set upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Another mention of the thousand years period. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Another mention. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Number six. And then in verse seven, and when, oh, another one. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Um, and shall go to see the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth and just going from there. But, you know, you see right here in these seven verses, six, six, seven times, um, a thousand years is mentioned. And that's why, again, like I said, I've always looked at this as literal thousand years. You know, it's mentioned too many times as a thousand years for it not to be literal. This isn't, you know, cattle in a thousand hills mentioned one time you know this is this is over and over again you know the word of god just hammering this point at the end of the book of revelation it must be meaningful it, it, he god wants us to get it um and so you know again if the birth of christ began the clock and you know i, I speculate both ways I, I speculate well maybe the death burial and resurrection you know, which let's just say 80, 30, you know, um, some people will date it a little earlier. Some people 30, 80, 33, a little later, but just a good round number, 80, 30. If a thousand years has been added and we're not in 2019, but 1019, then 2030 is really 1030 and only 11 years away from a literal 1000 years. So, you know, if this really did happen where, you know, Tom has been added to our calendar to distance us and cast doubt on his certain return that's prophesied over and over again, then we may be very close to the end of this thousand years, a literal 1000 years. Um, and, and so looking at it from that perspective first, from the time, from the clock starting at Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and if a thousand years has been added, then, you know, maybe we're approaching that in a few years. Then, you know, this has, there's, there's no eschatology viewpoint that coincides with this. You know, you have the premillennial viewpoint looking at it as a literal thousand years, but it's in the future, a thousand year future period after the second return of Christ. You have the post-millennial view and Lou, you mentioned this. I look at, I look at the post-millennial, I think it's taught where, um, I may be confused or wrong about, but from what I understand, the post-millennial view is that there is a period of time that is where things get better and better. Um, and the gospel goes out into all nations and that this world comes together through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's this literal thousand year golden age period on earth, um, of peace and harmony prior to Jesus second coming. Um, that's what I understand as yeah, post can, I, uh, can I interject here? Cause I, uh, I, it is an important point you're making that I, and I want to make a distinction in that when I, say that my position is post-millennial uh, is I don't embrace that part of the post-millennial viewpoint that we're, we're going to get better and better and better like that. I, I think we're going to get worse and worse. The birth pains get closer to go closer together. So it's the exact opposite. I'm only post-millennial in the viewpoint that I think it's a literal thousand years that we're getting close to uh, where this kingdom Jesus said he established is uh, running out thousand years. But also, you know Ray Kurzweil. Uh, he's the uh, like the, the the main guy of, of um, he runs Google, and uh, he, he's famous for prophecies. 
not not spiritually in a spiritual sense, but but just putting two and two together and and being very smart about uh, predicting uh, scientific breakthroughs. And well, he he says that the singularity of artificial intelligence coming into existence um, and having its own uh, awareness that this is going to happen in 2029. And so he's he's probably um, onto that better than anybody else. The consensus of, of everybody in that line of work is uh, by 2040 that this will happen. It's called singularity. But Ray Kurzweil says in 2029. So if he's right and we have the singularity, the artificial intelligence happening, and then right a year at, a year within a year after that, we have a thousand years of past. It just all fits together like a. If, it, if the glove fits, you must quit or something. It just fits like a glove. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a Johnny Cochran quote in the OJ trial. <laughs> um, so we've covered the premillennial and postmillennial. The amillennial viewpoint, again, is that it's not a literal thousand years. That's why the A is in front of millennial because it's not a literal 1000 years, but they do look at a, a spiritual time period between Christ's first coming and second coming. And that we are ruling again, like I said, as Kings and priests now through the gospel of Jesus Christ, part of the first resurrection through our faith in Jesus Christ. Um, but again, it's not looking at it as a literal thousand years, but, um, um, a spiritual church age and amillennialists will often use that verse that you quoted in the book of Psalms about the cattle in a thousand years, that it's just a representative time period of a, a long time. Um, but if we look at this as the book of revelation was written to us and revelation 20 is the summation of the book of revelation of a literal 1000 year time period from either the birth or death burial, and res resurrection of jesus christ to a second coming then we haven't reached that point um quite yet if we're looking at it from his death burial resurrection and that that brings into play i think if you had to name this viewpoint that this study brings about it would be akin to a literal of millennial viewpoint where the tenets of the being in the spiritual kingdom reigning as kings and priests being part of the first resurrection with satan being bound not bound in the sense that he has no power but bound in the sense that the gospel's going out to all nations and he can't stop it bound in the sense that he's been cast down from heaven um you know and and so just a few verses about Satan being bound, you know, just to cover that. But let me just go. So I want to look at it now, Revelation 21 through 7, as a literal thousand year odd millennial viewpoint. Um, and so that's sort of the eschatology that really this study brings to attention um, and to look at some more. But, you know, first of all, we are, you know, Jesus says that, you know, his, it, he, he didn't come to be king of an earthly kingdom, but his kingdom's a heavenly kingdom, a spiritual kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 15, 23, 22 through 25 or 26, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his order, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, they that are Christ that has come and then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the father, when he shall put down all rule and authority and power for he first must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So I believe when Jesus comes back, he's going to come back to judge the world with the judging of hell and death as being part of this corruptible world that will be judged. Um, and that last enemy will be judged at a second coming. Um, and that there's not a, a future thousand year earthly kingdom that he's setting up. Um, you know, we're kings and priests right now in first Peter two, nine and 10, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, um, in revelation one, five and six, 
and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Um, again, like I said, Jesus established, always established the spiritual kingdom, not a future earthly thousand year kingdom. Um, in John 18, 36, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then will my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom, not from hence. Um, and in other places, you know, he quotes in Luke four, where um, he's quoting Isaiah 61 says, you know, this time has been fulfilled, you know, prophesying of himself and of the kingdom of heaven has come at that present moment. Um, and so the last thing that all millennials will um, have to answer is, well, how can you say Satan is bound right now if there's so much evil and stuff going in the world today? Um, you know, that Christ is going to come and there's going to be peace for a thousand years and then he's going to be loose out of his prison after a thousand years, but there's no way that he's bound now. Um, but, you know, there's many verses that show where Jesus at his first coming and through his gospel and bringing in the kingdom of heaven bound Satan. We see it multiple times um, in John 12, 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Um, you know, Matthew 12 talks about the war in heaven when Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought against his age angels prevailed not neither was their found place anymore in heaven and the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him so and this is talking about at the time when the man child with the rod of iron was brought forth, you know, speaking of the first coming of Jesus Christ, that that was the judgment. Um, that was when he was cast out of heaven. Um, and then in Matthew 12, 27 through 29, Jesus answers the Pharisees that were accusing him of working by the power of Beelzebub. And he says, and if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his good goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Uh, and so I think that Satan is bound from a spiritual sense that he is not deceiving the nations or has not up to this point deceived the nations to rebel against God to hasten his second return. It's prophesied that this will happen, that, you know, there will be an apostasy, apostasy of falling away first, and the Antichrist will be set up a literal Antichrist. Now we've been, you know, Jesus says, you know, you've heard of Antichrist and there's many Antichrists now. Um, so we are living this past thousand years since Jesus, um, God manifests in the flesh, we are living in a time period where there is a spirit of antichrist and evil men has always um, been around uh, and influencing the world, this corruptible world into doing evil. Now, this leads me to looking at this possibly one other way. And I've recently been looking at this and I've talked about the day of the Lord um, being from, you know, in certain parts of scripture, it's prophesying of Jesus first coming and other parts prophesying of second coming and then use um, everywhere in between um, to, de to describe that time period. Um, you know, if this is a literal thousand years and it's from the birth of Christ and not the death, burial, resurrection, then, and if a thousand years has been added, so try to follow along with me. I, this may be confusing, but hopefully not. If a thousand years has been added and we're not in 2019, but 1019, and if the clock starts with Jesus' birth, let's just say 1 AD, 
you know, cause there's really no day zero or date zero. It's either one BC, one AD. So the clock started at his birth at one AD. Then a thousand years stopped at 2001. If we look at our current time period, now a thousand years, it would be 1001. You know, a thousand years has been added, but it looks possibly that a thousand years has been added. And so the literal thousand years prophesied of in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 20, multiple times, if it stopped at 2001, then we are out of this prophecy time period, this thousand years. And now Satan has been loosed. And now he is deceiving the nations. Um, and I watched the video and I want to see if you can think of possibly anything, Luke or Renee, that happened of significance in 2001. Uh ha ha. So are they saying that he was bound all that time? So the amillennial viewpoint looks at Satan being bound from a spiritual standpoint, bound where he has been placed on this earth and bound by the gospel, where he can't deceive the nations into this final prophecy of the judgment of the world the second time after the flood being the first time. Um and so, but now possibly if the countdown is from the birth of Christ and 2001 ends the thousand years, we're now in this little season. And so I watched a video where what if the Twin Towers, the 9-11, wasn't a terrorist attack, but what if it was an inside job? And what if it was through evil men in high places that was a ritual or even a celebration, if you will, of the loosing of Satan to begin this little season that we see after he's bound a thousand years. And so we've seen a lot of crazy stuff in the last 18 years. Um, and Kali, so that Hindu God was also the picture of Kali was projected on the Empire State Building around that time. The God destroyer God of the Hindus. And we've had the rainbow flag projected mm -hmm. on the White House, right? Um, you know, which was a symbol of um, not be, not judging the world by water. Uh, so then he was bound, like in his activities, like he was still loose, but not loose, loose. Like he yeah, was, he was bound in what he could do. Like maybe his access was cut off to God or something. Right, yeah. right, and so okay. he was he was bound to the physical corruptible earth and okay. didn't have that access to the you. heavens, um, but okay. was cast down and bound on earth and limited by what he could do because of the gospel. But he can I still, see. but he can still persecute the church, and he can still use people. He can still, um, you know, deceive and mislead people from, you know trying to uh you know just doing doing things they shouldn't do for instance or or false gospels or whatever doing anything that he can do but the gospel is going to get to who it's going to get to through the power of god and that this thousand years now possibly could be over and that he is actually loose and that these things that we have seen over the last 18 years and luke you mentioned transhumanism and singularity and things like that. Renee, we've speculated on that with Brother right. Luke in the past about um, sort of where we are, you know, um, those are definitely to, things to look at, you know? Yeah, and, yeah I and mean, that's all, a concept, I, but I would have to check, does, does his being bound have to, is there anything that has to happen before that? Like does, does, I can't remember like the process, like does, doesn't all the nations have to gather against Israel and all this stuff have to happen before he's bound or it doesn't say, I can't remember if it says what order. Yeah, right? no. Okay. I, I can't, I don't know off the top of my head. I've just got it in my head. Cause that's what I've, you know, 
read and had it in my mind. So I'd have to literally look at scripture to see because, you know, Revelation's not in chronological order. I mean, we've got Jesus's birth. We've got, you know, that everything's in the spiritual realm. So it doesn't happen chronologically in the book. And it's all written in Old Testament typography. And you can understand it better through Daniel and Zechariah and those prophets. It's not a Gentile book at all. And so I'd have to check that out to see if there's any other place in scripture that says, hey, such and such has to happen before he's bound. But if it doesn't, that's an interesting idea because there was, I mean, right after that too, Jason, was where we were seeing men that were possessed. They check them for drugs and everything. They started cannibalizing. They would rip their clothes off and just start eating people. Remember that was happening in Florida and in weird places all over the country. Like crazy stuff was happening. And then the paranormal boom took off with all these shows and houses being uh, possessed by demons and paranormal activity all over and Bigfoot creatures and UFOs and all that happened around that time. So you, I mean, that's what to think about. Yeah. And, and I look at it also, you know, when we were talking about transhumanism and, and those type of subjects, you know, the goal of, of transhumanism is for man to reach immortality through the work of their own hands. That's you know? right. That's right. You know, and to change oh, God's God. image into something else in order to gain immortality. It's yeah. truly a transhumanism, as I've kidded before, is truly a workspace salvation. You know, yeah. I mean, people yeah. are using technology to try to live forever. And yeah, Mark of the Beast could have something to do with changing our genetics, you know, and, and, it, could, and it could, you know, but I, I look at like the things that are going on just in the past decade or so, you know, if if we do look at possibly Satan, this thousand, this literal thousand years had prophecy time period being expired and now Satan is loose and that we're in Satan's little season, you know, how long is that? I don't know. But, you know, I look at transgenderism and how that has been just like pumped down our throats in the media and, and everywhere else over the last few years. That is simply a bridge to transhumanism. You know, transgenderism yeah. Yeah. is simply a bridge for man to get, you know, the sheep who are blinded in this world to accept something a little bit more down the road. Well, if we can change our gender now, what is it if we can change, you know, our, says, our image itself? Jim says he's trans age. He says, look, I should be able to drink because I identify as a 21 year old. <laughs> hey, James, uh, trust me, James, of you course. don't want to start drinking. It's really not. No, you're joking. It's not fun. You oh, he's kidding. He's kidding. Yeah, like, don't, please don't tell him I'm just kidding. Drinking is nothing good that comes from drinking. But no, you don't want to do that. You just well, be. I, I got to say a couple of things here. One, uh, uh, bro brother Jason, I, I think you did an excellent job uh, showing the verses and explaining the position of, about Satan being bound. Um, uh, on on my my playlist, dispensationalism, futurism, etc. That I, I told you about earlier. Um, I made one video that uh, it's the number one on the on the list of uh, the playlist, but all the other videos are collected uh, from other people. And I have a lot of videos on that subject talking about Satan being bound and, and explaining how you did it. So but if you want to have more, learn more about why, why is, how could Satan be bound today? Is that how what do you mean? How is it possible? And uh, then go to that playlist to see it. But we also, to those who, who were not with us a few months ago, when we had this group discussion about our, uh, AI and uh, transhumanism, I hope you will go watch that because what the, what's being said right now about transhumanism being a, a method to get eternal life, and that's going to be offered to humanity. Come on, they're going to say, you're not going to think that you're going to get eternal life by believing in Jesus. Don't be ridiculous. We can give you eternal life now with our technology. Don't turn that down. So that, I believe, I think that there's really good reason to believe that that may be, uh, have to do with this mark of the beast uh, that we are, uh, and it may be um, uh, a way of, of accomplishing that. Mark of the beast is take, accepting trends and trying to get eternal life through technology. 
So I hope you go watch that uh, discussion we did on that subject in our archive. Um, okay, um, um, I don't want to take off on any, any other subjects. So continue, uh, Brother Jason, whatever you want to cover next. Um, you know, so again, just looking at this holistically from, um, you know, the thousand years being added possibly to our timeline. Uh, and if it has that, you know, we may be approaching this prophetic thousand years or if it's this, the, you know, the time started at the birth of Christ, we may be out of this prophetic 1000 year period and that we may be now in Satan's little season. Um, you know, what this has got me, I think, looking at now is the book of Revelation is a book written to the church, the literal thousand year church age leading up to a second coming. Um, and that the book of Revelation is describing events occurring during this literal thousand years between his first and second coming. Um, and so I look at the rider on the white horse in Revelation 6, uh, the first seal um, being opened as Jesus Christ, not the Antichrist. You know, a lot of people look at it as the Antichrist. Um, I look at the white horse and the rider of that as Jesus. Or if it's not a person, if the rider's not a, a specific person, but the gospel you know, through the work of Jesus Christ uh, coming in to start this thousand years. And that we see from Revelation 6 all the way to Revelation 19, we see events from a historical standpoint within this thousand year period being prophesied. And we see the end times of this final future events that has not yet happened, this time of tribulation that is also, you know, again, it could be a dual prophecy like the, like the time and times and dividing of time, you know, Revelation 6 and 9 through 19 could be a dual prophecy where it's not only looking at the last three and a half years or seven years, however you want to look at it, uh, no matter what, there's going to be a seven years before, you know, the end um, that it also could be referring to events happening within this literal thousand years. And so um, Revelation 19, for instance, you see Jesus, uh, the word of God coming back on the white horse. You know, so I think from Genesis, I'm sorry, from Revelation 6. And the rider of the first horse being Jesus Christ in the gospel, initiating this literal thousand years to Revelation 19 being his second return and the conclusion of this thousand years. And then Revelation 20 being a summary of the thousand years and what is happening from a spiritual standpoint um, with Satan being bound, Satan being loose, having the little season, uh, and then Jesus coming back to judge the world, but during that time period, that thousand years that the gospel's going out, uh, believers are reigning in his spiritual kingdom as kings and priests, part of the first resurrection, uh, the dead not being judged until after that thousand years when he returns. And then there's going to be the judgment of the just and the unjust. Um, so I'm reading the book of Revelation and then looking at Old Testament prophecy, as well as Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, um, you know, these end times, the Olivet Discourse, um, prophetic passages and chapters, and looking at that from this perspective, a literal thousand years. And I think that's what the book of Revelation is discussing. Um, and I think that John wrote it to the church in preparation for this time. And I think Luke is, I think it's getting close, man. I think Renee, I think it is very close. Um, and that we are either coming to the very end of this literal thousand year prophetic time period or that we're, that that time period has been fulfilled and now we're in Satan's little season. Um, so how long is Satan's little season? You know, if it started in, you know, just uh, again, 
just speculating here. Um, but if the Twin Towers came down in celebration of his loosing and the end of this thousand year period, um, then how long is it going to last? The, you know, Satan's, a, Satan's an imitator. He wants to be like God. He wants to ascend into the heavens uh, and sit on the throne and in the sides of the congregation in heavenly Jerusalem. Um, I have a feeling that this time period may mirror Jesus' life, um, you know, with the Antichrist being the fulfillment of Judas Iscariot and that Jesus, um, from his birth to his death, lived 33, 33 and a half years. You know, the number 33, I think, is significant in um, in Freemasonry and different things like that. Um, but his ministry started right about the age of 30. Um, most historicists would say, biblical historicists will say lasted three and a half years. Um, I think that Satan being loose, he could be loose for 30 years, like 30 literal years. He's a, cop and that, he's a copycat, that's for sure. He's a copycat. And the last three and a half years is going to be a copy of Jesus' ministry and that he is going to use the Antichrist to lead people, the B system. And I think that ultimately that the Antichrist, whoever that person, it's going to be a literal person, I think will die and I think will be resurrected and Satan will possess that person. And then that person will lead people into possibly accepting the mark of the beast where this mark, it may not be a physical thing, but a spiritual mark of, I can give you immortality. You know, Jesus gives us immortality through his death, burial, and resurrection, through our faith in him. Satan is going to offer the world immortality, but he's not going to be able to deliver. Um, but again, he's a copycat and he's a mimicker. And if the clock started at 2001 in this little season, and again, I'm not setting the date. I don't know the day and the hour. We're just speculating here. But, you know, if all these things are starting to come into place and, you know, the puzzle pieces are coming together, it's 2019. We're 18 years in, you know, there may be 12 15 years and we could literally still be, we could literally see a lot of tribulation going on. You know, Luke, you, you mentioned the singularity. I think artificial intelligence and transhumanism is going to be huge in 10 years. Um, I think they're hiding technology and that they're a lot more advanced than they let the public know about. I agree with that. Absolutely. Um, I, agree with that. I, th I think that, you know, we mentioned this on the last program earlier, um, speaking of NASA and, you know, accomplishing their goal a few years later after their institution of, you know, um, putting a man in space, um, the Space Force is going to be set up in 2020. Um, it's already written into, you know, as part of an admin administrative branch of the military. It's going to be the sixth branch of the military in the U.S. Um, military force, the Space Force. The name uh, of that, I'm sorry, it sounds like a five-year-old came up with an Space oh, Force. It's, it's hilarious. It yeah. sounds so funny. Google it and see, and see President Trump introduce the Space Force. It's so it funny. To funny. And then you have all these people behind him in the background chanting Space Force, Space what? Force. It's a riot. Star Wars, right? But, but anyway, you know, Every time, every time a government sets up something, it's for a reason. Mm -hmm. They will, they will use the. If they set it up in 2020, they're going to use the space force at some time after that for some reason. Um, and you know the the judgments coming on the earth uh, that we see in the Book of Revelation. Um, there's a lot of things going on now where this world is being deceived if these things do happen the world 
will tell you, oh, it's climate change. It is meteor showers. It is aliens. It's this or that. You know, they won't tell you that these are the judgments coming, you know, right before Jesus comes back. And really setting you up for that. And Probably yeah, and so it, it's spiritual deception at its best. Um, and I think we may be in that period. I think, you know, say, I think Satan may be truly deceiving the nations for this moment of rebellion um, that the Antichrist will lead um, in a one world type government. Um, Luke, did you mention on the last show about um, President Reagan and others, you know, um, speculating, you know, and about if there was a force from another planet that came down to Earth and, you know, that would be a great thing because the world would gather together as one, you know, yeah, a new world 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 world. Right. called it. Right. right. Um, I, you know, yeah. all these little things, I think we're being set up um, for something uh, to happen possibly in our lifetime, if not our children's lifetime. I, I just wanted to say one thing because uh, uh, somebody didn't mention it in the chat room. I I think it's a fascinating concept on Satan. But uh, since my thing is to believe in a literal like period on Earth where we do, you know, turn our weapons into plowshares and stuff, I think Satan, Satan has to be bound for a thousand years or in order to have that peace. And then at the end of that period, he's let loose and it shows how rebellious people really are, because even under the rule of Jesus, Satan's still able to deceive them and make one last tempt at coming against Jesus at the end. And then he you know, faces judgment. That's just I just want to answer my position. But I, I am willing to listen to that possibility. And do I agree that all of that stuff you said was inspired by him and has great spiritual significance? Absolutely, I do. Uh, you know. yeah. and, and so, again, you know, this whole study is just to introduce this. Yeah. Um, and I'm not trying to sway anybody and say, yeah. you know, this is this is the way you should look at eschatology now. I'm just introducing it sure. used as a guideline to strengthen, you know, maybe your viewpoint on another thing. Maybe you look at it, you search the scriptures, you dismiss. It's it and it makes your view um, that you already have stronger. And that's fine. You know, again, I came from a pre-millennial viewpoint um, sure. and I see exactly how people look at that. You know, whether it's a pre-trib, a pre raft post-trib, you know, all those things. We haven't even talked about the rapture or anything. And really the study it and about that, I don't, I don't have a great opinion about that. Um, but um, again, I'm not trying to sway anybody's view. I'm not sure, even of course. absolutely right. Um, I think that, I think that there has been a manipulation of time. Mm -hmm. I think that there could be a couple of historical resets. And you've got some stuff to support that. I mean, it's a strong case. What yeah. you come up I, with. And so I think there, you know, there has been some historical resets um, with this being a possibility of a thousand years being added. Um, that's and, and the reason I looked at it from that standpoint is because of Scripture um, and seeing the thousand years and the prophecy within that and looking at why would we be deceived about this? And, you know, again, it all leads back to you know, distancing ourselves from the gospel, from Christ yeah. and casting doubt on his certain return. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I want people to be Bereans. Just look at it more. There's going to be stuff that I definitely hadn't seen in scripture. Like, like I said, I want to read the book of Revelation a few times, yeah. looking at it as possibility. That this is a book of prophecy for the last thousand year literal generation um, this church age between the first coming and Jesus' second coming. Um, and then look at other scripture and see if it uh, aligns with it or not. You know, I may come back in a year and have a completely different view. Sure. Um, but, you know, again, I started out just sort of looking at this. I've had it in the back of my mind for a few years and really started reading the Bible um, based on this. And you know how, how it is where if you're not looking for something, you don't see it in the Bible right. and you can read it. Um, and so I've done that on many different topics. Um, and, and so I wanted to read it sort of looking at it from a prophetic standpoint and seeing that there's some things and 
this That's is what I am times. prepared. He changes huh? times. You can't get past that. He changes time. The, the changing time. That's what started it. The changing of times and laws and then the time, times and dividing of time. I'm like, okay. Um, I remember some, you know, things that I've studied from a history standpoint. And it all goes back to the dark ages too. There's just no, there's I mean, nothing there. There's there nothing is there. Really nothing there's there. nothing there. It's filled in. You know, I think that a lot of things within the dark ages are just contemporaneous with time periods. They're real people and real events. It just happened more contemporaneously. It wasn't a separate thousand year period. Um, Look what's been done in a hundred years, Jason. In just yeah. 100 years, we went from horses and carriages to airplanes in 100 uh -huh. years. But we didn't do anything of any substance for 1,500 uh -huh. years. You know? Right. right. It's an amazing idea. I, I never thought of it. It's just fascinating. I mean, well, I mean, if you look at the, it, not just about the thousand year reign, overall, stat statistically, more events, more inventions, more things happen as. It don't, it's it's exponentially growing. Yeah. Like you have so fast. Also, yeah. also always. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, we're getting uh, we're getting close to a two hour uh, uh, talk here, so we'll, we'll let's start winding this down. But first, I need to uh, respond. Uh, Matthias made a comment a long time ago, asking if I would uh, try to explain his point of view on this thousand years for everybody. To consider, and uh, uh, Matthias agrees with you, Jason, and, and me that this um, um, kingdom that Jesus talked about is a spiritual kingdom that's happening right now. But he does think that the quote thousand year period is is uh, actually in the future for a literal thousand years, but it's not on Earth; it's off in another dimension or in heaven or someplace else. So he has a, uh, a position uh, that's uh, kind of a blend of a different ideas and, and, and that's unique that I haven't heard before. So, uh, and he also asked Jason, if you could tell us your thoughts on Revelation 20 verse five, but before you do that, if you could look that up and expound on that. But be, uh, before you do, I'm gonna just say, that as we're winding this down that I, have an exhortation and I uh, it, it's as usual uh, I've said this before many many times it's just it's my, it's one of my great disappointments in the church and I'm talking about our congregation and believers as a whole and that is the unwillingness to actually listen to a different viewpoint and I confess that I held on to viewpoints for 25 years on end times, on Bible translations, on eschatol, uh, on, on um, uh, eternal torment. A lot of things I held on to because the person that I respected so much, uh, I read all their books, I was indoctrinated and never questioned it. Um, but only when I decided that uh, I need to hear out the other viewpoint when people point out a different something different to me before i would just ignore it but once i decided that wait a second they deserve to be heard and considered um several of viewpoints i finally realized that i i think i was wrong and i changed my mind to a different position and uh that I, this is something that saddens me i don't see very many people in the church even in this congregation I don't see very many people who are actually really willing to take the time to study a different viewpoint on something, uh, whatever their pet position is that they're holding on to, uh, they don't even listen to another viewpoint. And you're talking about restudying Revelation, Jason. Um, I study the book of Revelation one verse at a time from a preterist teacher, and then I did the same thing from a from a historicist teaching. And of course, I already had studied it for 25 years from a futurist viewpoint. So I got to read the, the, get the book of Revelation from the three popular viewpoints and, and compare. And I, I, don't, I don't know people. People are not, not willing to listen. 
as soon as they, they hear a different viewpoint that different there, they, they just either dismiss it completely or, or impugn it. And uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, Revelation 20, verse 5, uh, Matthias would like to get your thoughts on that, uh, Jason. Okay, I'm back. Um, yeah, we read that within the, the passage uh, earlier. Uh, so verse five, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So, you know, in, in context, it shows in verse three that Satan's been cast into the bottomless pit, um, that after after that thousand years he must be loose for a little season then you know if you look at the amillennial viewpoint then there's this literal thousand year church age where it goes in the verse four where they lived and reigned with christ a thousand years and you know verse six sort of discusses who that first resurrection is 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 those Basically, the first resurrection, like I mentioned earlier, I think is the first fruits. I think it's Christ. He's the first resurrection and that believers in Christ um, during the church age, you know, who have heard the gospel, that they are part of his resurrection. They're part of, you know, they're crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live um, and part of the resurrection of Christ. I think that's the that's the resurrection it's talking about. Um, that's why it says the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and reign with him a thousand years. That's why I read those early, earlier verses about, you know, that we're reigning with Christ right now as kings and priests on this earth through the gospel. Um, if you look at this eschatology viewpoint of amillennialism uh, and then this topic being a literal thousand years, um, with the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. You know, so basically that's after this time period of Christ's first and second coming, this literal thousand year church age, you know, during this church age, believers are ruling and reigning with Christ in a spiritual kingdom and part of the first resurrection. And then once he comes back, he's judging the rest of the dead after that thousand years. So that's how I sort of look at that. Let me, uh, uh, I'm, I'm really, uh, this portion of scriptures you just read and the way you expounded upon it, I believe is exactly right. I first heard that viewpoint from Aaron Budgen. And, uh, but I will, uh, to make sure that, that we're in agreement on this, I, I want to define something and get your thoughts and see if, if we are in agreement. That the first resurrection is not a bodily resurrection. If you think of the first resurrection as the resurrection of our spirit, the new birth, uh, every time since when um, since uh, Jesus time until this thousand years is up, all the people who believe in Jesus have their spirits resurrected, brought to life spiritually. And then the second resurrection is the resurrection of the body. Most people think that the first resurrection and the second resurrections are two separate Resur bodily resurrections of, of, of believers at different times. Um, and so uh, that's where I think the, the, the dispensational futurism and all that is uh, has influenced. That's that's a result of uh, John Nelson Darby's teaching. Um, but are, are, did I, uh, are we in agreement on that? Is the first resurrection, the resurrection of us, uh, our spirits being brought to life with a new birth? Yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. That's that's what you know. That's what I was showing that the the first resurrection is the first fruits. It's Christ's resurrection, and we're part of that resurrection through our faith in Christ. It's yeah. from a spiritual standpoint. We're you know we're we're seated in heavenly places, right? We're translated into the kingdom now and seated at heavenly places with Christ right now, part of His resurrection. But when He comes to judge the just and the unjust, there will be the second resurrection. There will be the bodily, bodily resurrection. Um, and those in Christ will, that's what we're waiting on. You know, that this, 
our our flesh and blood, this corruptible flesh will die, will be buried. Believers are trusting in God's promise and the inheritance of his promises through Christ and that we will be part of that second resurrection, the body. Um, and that, you know, I, I think it says that in Revelation 8. Um, that's what we're awaiting. Can I, okay. I have a, I'm in agreement with y'all on the first resurrection with a slightly different thing. Can I just say what that is real quick? Yeah. Um, like, I believe the first resurrection is not a one time event. I think like it, it's all of those that are in Christ now and will be saved before his coming. Uh, and I believe the first resurrection, I believe the Old Testament saints, they were walking around Jerusalem. I believe they got it. And I believe that uh, we will be given our glorified body and all that are in, for, in the first resurrection will actually rule and reign with Christ in his, I believe, in the literal kingdom. So I think that's why it says blessed are those in the first resurrection. And then, like Jason said, the second resurrection is the just and the unjust. It's people that get saved that survive this period and go into there and so forth. So I just wanted to say I agree with y'all completely on that. I just have a different view of that last part. Of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, the, the, the distinction is that um, the first resurrection is um, uh, collective, but it's also individual. I had, I experienced the first resurrection individually. You did too. And I'm going to experience the second resurrection uh, personally. And it's also going to be broadly uh, every person who's ever lived. Uh, so, but, uh, uh, but they're ruling and reigning after the first resurrection that we're ruling and reigning with, with Christ right now as uh, part of this uh, kingdom that Jesus says he initiated uh, in, in his incarnation. That's how I think Jason and I are, are, are representing this. But you think the rain is a literal rain in the future, a literal I think future. it's both. I think it's both. Like, I think all of us that are saved, we're in the kingdom now, and we can draw on those promises now as he is, so are we in this world. It's without observation, but I still believe it's also uh, literal. Like, I believe it double meaning to okay uh, is there uh is there any, let's take the time now since we're about at the two hour mark and uh um see if there's anything else you needs to be said about this uh jason and uh, and then we'll kind of sum up our our thoughts on the talk tonight um no i think we covered this pretty well and are really well and i appreciate you having me on the channel to discuss it further and um Again, I didn't mean to make 10 videos on this over the past year. It's just something that I just kept seeing and then doing a little more research. Um, it sort of added to um, this you know, hypothesis, if you will, this new perspective um, of looking at end time scenarios and the eschatology. Um, you know, and so you know, I think it it does introduce a new eschatology viewpoint, a new perspective. Um, and I'm definitely not saying that it's right because, you know, when I first looked at it, I was about the only one that, you know, had had ever concluded this. Um, and so I'm well in the minority and I understand that. Um, but hopefully this edifies the body into looking at eschatology in times, because I think we are in the end of end times. Um, I think there is um, going to be a lot of events coming, um, you know, within the next decade that we need to watch. And, um, you know, if this adds to um, strengthening of the body so that people are sober and mindful of these things and are watching and are ready to whatever role it is that God will have us um, to do during these end times, then I think it's a, a fruitful uh, study and I'm glad that we're talking about it. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Uh, Renee, what would you like yeah. to say in closing on this? Well, I wanted to say, you know, if I think so much of Brother Jason and you, Luke. So if you guys find a topic worthy of discussion, then I certainly am happy to oblige at least listening and discussing it. You know, so I mean, I have that much faith in you guys that if you found 
something worthy of your attention, especially Jason, with the how busy you are being a physician and so forth. If you take time to look into something, then I'm I'm happy to at least discuss it. And hopefully people heard you, you know, that it's, hey, you're not saying it's true or it's not true. You're just saying, hey, look at this. What about this? Let's look at things another way. Let's, you know, investigate this further. And I, I think that's a good attitude to have. And I hope, you know, uh, that's what people get from this is that they can see that we're open minded. We're trying to communicate. We're trying to uh, be gracious to one another and hear each other out. You know, nobody's trying to uh, force opinions on anybody or anything. This is just discussion. And that's what Luke calls it. Uh, fellowship Friday, which is great. It is about fellowship, being with one another and talking about things. And I really appreciate it. It was fascinating. Like I was surprised at how much information you had gathered on this. And um, it was really interesting. I, I can't think of a better way to spend my Friday evening. <laughs> hey, that's yeah. Amen. Well, that's that's what's so wonderful about uh, the saints in this congregation uh, is what would we rather be doing than talking about Jesus in the, in the Bible? And yeah, some people like to go out to dancing and drinking and that's how, how they get their kicks. And But for us, we get a kick out of Jesus in the Bible and uh, we're fascinated. You never, we can never get too much of it. But let me uh, sum it up this way. Um, I am feel so blessed that this congregation that we call the Church of the Eternally Secure, uh, the the congregation as a whole, and then also those who are kind of the up front, uh, the I'll just call them the leaders: uh, uh, Daniel, uh, Matthias, Renee, my, myself, uh, Jason, uh, uh, Michael, uh, Brother Cripps, Brother Leo, the people who are out kind of the faces of, of this, uh, who are trying to answer the questions and do some teaching. Um, I think we have a very, very gifted community here. And uh, we know that Renee has a great gift at, we call her the untwisted sister. She has a great gift for helping people understand these problem verses that trouble people. And, uh, um, and everybody I mentioned has their own gifts, but I think, Brother uh, Jason Jack here, he's very, very gifted. He, he I've watched uh, maybe not every video, but probably 90, 95% of all his videos I've watched. And and there's a lot of profound things that he, he said that are even unique. That he has some insights that are totally unique. And I believe that God is speaking to him and through him. Um, not that everything he comes up with is thus saith the Lord, but I think God is giving him some incredible insights that many of us are missing and, and God's using him. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing this again, uh, Brother Jason. I want to, to have a talk just like this with you regarding your thoughts on some of the characters in the Bible that we uh, that you think are a little bit different identities than, than who we thought. I'm thinking of Mary and Lazarus and some of those things you've done on these people who uh, it would, they would surprise people. And uh, I, you know what I'm referring to, but uh, I hope you'll be willing to do that in the near future too. Man, is that all right? Yeah. Um, if you look at the gospels and, and look at the different um, storylines within it and seeing the different characters within it, each gospel gives a little bit different um, record of something that is almost like a puzzle piece that has to be harmonized sometimes to understand who's where and who it is. Um, and so, yeah, I, I totally know what you're talking about with the study on Mary Magdalene, study of Joseph of Arimathea. Um, and, um, and I'm even thinking about doing a video soon on um, Mary's children and who exactly they were and and that's that's a pretty detailed deep study i'm still sort of looking at searching the scriptures on that yeah. um but yeah that would be great to do in the future 
Yeah, I think everybody is going to be very uh, intrigued and enlightened when we do that. And I, instead of Lazarus, I was actually Joseph of Arimathea, who you are, are uh, speculating on. That's very interesting. So well, uh, I, I, I did speculate on Lazarus too, with you know, with with the parable um, that most people look at as a parable yes. with Lazarus. Um, that Lazarus was rich in real life. <laughs> The other Lazarus was. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I look at I look at that at that uh, passage. Uh, it's at Luke um, Luke sixteen or Luke eighteen, um, where where it discusses uh, the rich man and Lazarus. I, I think it's Lazarus. I think it's literally Lazarus and showing a picture of him in heaven before Jesus raised him from the dead. It's not it's not a fictional just name to to share a spiritual truth through a parable but it's a prophecy uh of the resurrection of lazarus and what happened during the time that he was dead um so yeah i did a video on that so you can check that out let's we can talk about it more let's let's do a group talk on that and uh, now that we summer's here you're very busy with your uh, not only your ministry, but your um, plastic surgery. You're doing some miraculous things there, I can imagine, too. Uh, and also your family uh, requires a lot of your time. So now that it's summer, you got a little more time. I want to take advantage of it and do some more of these, these programs. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, also uh, we uh, enjoyed this uh, Flat Earth conversation earlier enough to uh, we've all decided we're going to do uh, more of them, maybe at least one more. And so, but I'm, uh, I'm kind of worn out. Uh, we've actually had four hours instead of two hours, two hours back to back programs. Uh, I've enjoyed it every minute of it though. So thank you uh, to everybody in the chat room for being there. And uh, especially thanks to uh, brother Jason and sister Renee for, um, for their time tonight. Uh, all right, we'll see. Don't forget to, to join us um, every Friday night for Fellowship Friday. And on, nor on a normal Friday night, what I'll do is I'll post the link so anybody can join uh, uh, in the panel discussion. I don't have an open panel except for those Friday night programs. And then uh, join us Wednesday night for the Bible study. We did last Wednesday, we did the, uh, we started uh, First Corinthians, and that's very exciting. And then, of course, join us every Sunday also for the ch Sunday church program. So thank you to everybody and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. <laughs>